This is the story of a man named Stanley. Stanley worked for a company in a big building where he was employee number 427. Employee number 427's job was simple. He sat at his desk in room 427 and he pushed buttons on the keyboard. Orders came to him through a monitor on his desk, telling him what buttons to push, how long to push them, and in what order. This is what employee 427 did every day, every month, of every year. And although others might have considered it soul ripping, Stanley relished every moment that the orders came in, as though he had been made exactly for this job. And Stanley was happy. And then one day, something very peculiar happened. Something that would forever change Stanley. Something he would never quite forget. He had been at his desk for nearly an hour when he realized that not one single order had arrived on the monitor for him to follow. No one had showed up to give him instructions, call a meeting, or even say hi. Never in all his years at the company had this happened, this complete isolation. Something was very clearly wrong. Shocked, frozen solid, Stanley found himself unable to move for the longest time. But as he came to his wits and regained his senses, he got up from his desk and his office. All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo. No matter how hard Stanley looked, he couldn't find a trace of his co-workers. Stanley came to a set of two open doors, he entered the door on his left. This was not the correct way to the meeting room and Stanley knew it perfectly well. Perhaps he wanted to stop by the employee lounge first, just to admire it. Truly a room worth admiring. It had really been worth the detour after all, just to spend a few moments here in this immaculate, beautifully constructed room. But eager to get back to business, Stanley took the first open door on his left. Stanley was so bad at following directions, it's incredible he wasn't fired years ago. Look Stanley, I think perhaps we've gotten off on the wrong foot here. I'm not your enemy, really, I'm not. I realize that investing in your trust in someone else can be difficult, but the fact is that the story has been about nothing but you all this time. There's someone you've been neglecting, Stanley. Someone you've forgotten about. Please, stop trying to make every decision by yourself. Now, I'm not asking for me, I'm asking for her. This is it, Stanley. Your chance to redeem yourself. To put your work aside. To let her back into your life. She's been waiting. That's her, Stanley. Oh, Stanley, is that 
that you? Uh, hold on, sweetie. Sorry to keep you waiting. I'm just pulling the bread out of the oven. All right. Okay, there we go. All right, now, I want you to come in and tell me all about your day. <laughs> gotcha. Oh, come on. Did you actually think you had a loving wife? Who'd want to commit their life to you? I'm trying to make a point here, Stanley. I'm trying to get you to see something. Come inside. Let me show you what's really going on here. This is a very sad story about the death of a man named Stanley. Stanley is quite a boring fellow. He has a job that demands nothing of him, and every button that he pushes is a reminder of the inconsequential nature of his existence. Look at him there, pushing buttons, doing exactly what he's told to do. Now he's pushing a button. Now he's eating lunch. Now he's going home. Now he's coming back to work. One might even feel sorry for him, except that he's chosen this life. But in his mind, ah, in his mind he can go on fantastic adventures. From behind his desk, Stanley dreamed of wild expeditions into the unknown, fantastic discoveries of new lands. It was wonderful, and each day that he returned to work was a reminder that none of it would ever happen to him. And so he began to fantasize about his own job. First he imagined that one day while at work, he stepped up from his desk to realize that all of his co-workers, his boss, everyone in the building had suddenly vanished off the face of the earth. The thought excited him terribly. So he went further. He imagined that he came to two open doors and that he could go through either. At last, choice. It barely even mattered what lay behind each door. The mere thought that his decisions would mean something was almost too wonderful to behold. As he wandered through this fantasy world, he began to fill it with many possible paths and destinations. Down one path lay an enormous round room with monitors and mind controls. And down another was a yellow line that weaved in many directions. And down another was a game with a baby. And he called it the Stanley Parable. It was such a wonderful fantasy. And so in his head, he relived it again and then again and again, over and over, wishing beyond hope that it would never end, that he might always feel this free. Surely there's an answer down some new path, mustn't there be? Perhaps if he played just one more time. But there is no answer. How could there possibly be? In reality, all he's doing is pushing the same buttons he always has. Nothing has changed. The longer he spends here, the more invested he gets, the more he forgets which life is the real one. And I'm trying to tell him this, that in this world he can never be anything but an observer, that as long as he remains here, he's slowly killing himself. But he won't listen to me. He won't stop. Here, watch this. Stanley, the next time the screen asks you to push a button, do not do it. You see? Can he just not hear me? How can I tell him in a way that he'll understand that every second he remains here, he's electing to kill himself? How can I get him to see what I see? How can I make him look at himself? I suppose I can't, not in the way I want him to. But I don't make the rules. I simply play to my intended purpose, the same as Stanley. 
We're not so different, I suppose. I'll try once more to convey all this to him. I'm compelled to. I must. Perhaps, well, maybe this time he'll see. Maybe this time. And I tried again, and Stanley pushed a button. And I tried again, and Stanley pushed a button. And I tried. All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo. When Stanley came to a set of two open doors, he entered the door on his left. Yet there was not a single person here either. Feeling a wave of disbelief, Stanley decided to go up to his boss's office, hoping he might find an answer there. Coming to a staircase, Stanley walked upstairs to his boss's office. Stepping into his manager's office, Stanley was once again stunned to discover not an indication of any human life. Shocked, unraveled, Stanley wondered in disbelief who orchestrated this, what dark secret was being held from him. What he could not have known was that the keypad behind the boss's desk guarded the terrible truth that his boss had been keeping from him, and so the boss had assigned it an extra secret pin number. Two, eight, four, five. But of course, yet incredibly, by simply pushing random buttons on the keypad, Stanley happened to input the correct code by sheer luck. Amazing. He stepped into the newly opened passageway. Descending deeper into the building, Stanley realized he felt a bit peculiar. It was a stirring of emotion in his chest, as though he felt more free to think for himself, to question the nature of his job. Why did he feel this now, when for years it had never occurred to him? This question would not go unanswered for long. Stanley walked straight ahead through the large door that read Mind Control Facility. The lights rose on an enormous room packed with television screens. What horrible secret did this place hold, Stanley thought to himself. Did he have the strength to find out? revealed. Each bore the number of an employee in the building, Stanley's co-workers. The lives of so many individuals reduced to images on a screen, and Stanley, one of them, eternally monitored in this place where freedom meant nothing. This mind control facility, it was too horrible to believe it couldn't be true. Had Stanley really been under someone's control all this time? Was this the only reason he was happy with his boring job? That his 
emotions had been manipulated to accept it blindly? No, he refused to believe it. He couldn't accept it. His own life in someone else's control? Never. It was unthinkable. Wasn't it? Was it even possible? Had he truly spent his entire life utterly blind to the world? But here was the proof, the heart of the operation. Controls labeled with emotions, happy or sad or content. Walking, eating, working, all of it monitored and commanded from this very place. And as the cold reality of his past began to sink in, Stanley decided that this machinery would never again exert its terrible power over another human life. For he would dismantle the controls once and for all. last he found the source of the room's blackness and a rising chill of uncertainty was it over Shackled himself from someone else's command. Freedom was mere moments away. And yet, even as the immense door slowly opened, Stanley reflected on how many puzzles still lay unsolved. Where had his co-workers gone? How had he been freed from the machine's grasp? What other mysteries did this strange building hold? But as sunlight streamed into the chamber, he realized none of this mattered to him. For it was not knowledge or even power that he had been seeking, but happiness. Perhaps his goal had not been to understand, but to let go. No longer would anyone tell him where to go, what to do, or how to feel. Whatever life he lives, it will be his. And that was all he needed to know. It was, perhaps, the only thing worth knowing. Stanley stepped through the open door. 
Stanley felt the cool breeze upon his skin, the feeling of liberation, the immense possibility of the new path before him. This was exactly the way, right now, that things were meant to happen. And Stanley was happy. co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo. When Stanley came to a set of two open doors, he entered the door on his left. Yet there was not a single person here either. Feeling a wave of disbelief, Stanley decided to go up to his boss's office, hoping he might find an answer there. Coming to a staircase, Stanley walked upstairs to his boss's office. But Stanley just couldn't do it. He considered the possibility of facing his boss, admitting he had left his post during work hours. He might be fired for that. And in such a competitive economy, why had he taken that risk? All because he believed everyone had vanished. His boss would think he was crazy. And then something occurred to Stanley. Maybe, he thought to himself, maybe I am crazy. All of my co-workers blinking mysteriously out of existence in a single moment for no reason at all. None of it made any logical sense. And as Stanley pondered this, he began to make other strange observations. For example, why couldn't he see his feet when he looked down? Why did doors close automatically behind him wherever he went? And for that matter, these rooms were starting to look pretty familiar. Were they simply repeating? No, Stanley said to himself, this is all too strange, this can't be real. And at last, he came to the conclusion that had been on the tip of his tongue. He just hadn't found the words for it. I'm dreaming, he yelled. This is all a dream. Oh, what a relief Stanley felt to have finally found an answer, an explanation. His co-workers weren't actually gone. He wasn't going to lose his job. He wasn't crazy after all. And he thought to himself, I suppose I'll wake up soon. I'll have to go back to my boring real-life job pushing buttons. I may as well enjoy this while I'm still lucid. So, he imagined himself flying and began to gently float above the ground. Then he imagined himself soaring through space on a magical star field, and it too appeared. It was so much fun, and Stanley marveled that he had still not woken up. How was he remaining so lucid? And then perhaps the strangest question of them all entered Stanley's head. One he was amazed he hadn't asked himself sooner. Why is there a voice in my head dictating everything that I'm doing and thinking? Now the voice was describing itself being considered by Stanley, who found it particularly strange. I'm dreaming about a voice describing me, thinking about how it's describing my thoughts, he thought. And while he thought it all very odd, and wondered if this voice spoke to all people in their dreams, the truth was that, of course, this was not a dream. How could it be? Was Stanley simply deceiving himself, believing that if he's asleep, he doesn't have to take responsibility for himself? Stanley is as awake right now as he's ever been in his life. Now hearing the voice speak these words was quite a shock to Stanley. After all, he knew for certain beyond a doubt that this was in fact a dream. Did the voice not see him float and make the magical stars just a moment ago? How else would the voice explain all that? This voice was a part of himself too. Surely, surely, if he could just... He would prove it. He would prove that he was in control that this was a dream. So he closed his eyes gently and he invited himself to wake up. He felt the cool weight of the blanket on his skin, the press of the mattress on his back, the fresh air of a world outside this one. 
Let me wake up, he thought to himself. I'm through with this dream. I wish it to be over. Let me go back to my job. Let me continue pushing the buttons. Please, it's all I want. I want my apartment and my wife and my job. All I want is my life exactly the way it's always been. My life is normal. I am normal. Everything will be fine. I am okay. Stanley began screaming. Please, someone, wake me up. My name is Stanley. I have a boss. I have an office. I am real. Please, just someone tell me I am real. I must be real. I must be. Can anyone hear my voice? Who am I? Who am I? And everything went black. This is the story of a woman named Mariella. Mariella woke up on a day like any other. She arose, got dressed, gathered her belongings and walked to her place of work. But on this particular day, her walk was interrupted by the body of a man who had stumbled through town talking and screaming to himself and then collapsed dead on the sidewalk. And although she would soon turn to go call for an ambulance, for just a few brief moments, she considered the strange man. He was obviously crazy, this much she knew. Everyone knows what crazy people look like. And in that moment, she thought to herself how lucky she was to be normal. I am sane. I am in control of my mind. I know what is real and what isn't. It was comforting to think this, and in a certain way, seeing this man made her feel better. But then she remembered the meeting she had scheduled for that day. The very important people whose impressions of her would affect her career, and by extension, the rest of her life. She had no time for this, so it was only a moment that she stood there, staring down at the body. And then she turned and ran. 